All right, Bethlehem, and certainly for those of you who are sharing with us in the virtual experience at Bethlehem Missionary Baptist Church, this is our graduates' day of 2021, and we certainly thank God for our graduates. Last year, interestingly, we had all young men, and all of the young men initially started with a J. And this year, we have women, young women. And we are proud and excited, particularly we have one who graduated from HBCU on her way to law school, another graduated from one of our premier uh, high schools here in the Bay Area, on her way to college, on her way to sports. You'll be looking out for Jasmine Farmer, they'll be in the day. We certainly give God praise for the graduates of 2021. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. We welcome you into the sanctuary of the Bethlehem Missionary Baptist Church, 684 Jelijah Woods Street, right here in the city of Richmond, California. Yes, we are church through the roof, pastored by the Reverend Alvin Bernstein. And we come on this third Sunday morning our afternoon to give you to give God the praise and to give him the glory for Psalms 106 says praise the Lord oh give thanks to the Lord for he is good and watch this and his mercy endureth forever I don't know about you but that's good news that's why we give him praise because his love never runs out so why don't you go get the kids go get the family and let's worship the Lord together as we give thanks to the Lord Hallelujah! Ah. Glory to God! Ah. Come on, right where you are, put your hands together and open your mouth and say it. Yeah. 
our sales for our BMBC pods. Wherever you're located, if you can find a quiet space for yourself, go ahead and find, if you can, a place to sit down. If you can, to go ahead and relax your feet on the floor. Straighten your back, but let your shoulders relax. Start to go ahead and pay attention to your breathing. Rest your hands on your lap. If wherever you are, you're safe and comfortable enough, go ahead and close your eyes. And if that's not a possibility, find something to focus your gaze. As we start with our three audible breaths, go ahead and do an audible inhale. And an audible exhale. Allowing your shoulders to relax. Again, another audible inhale. And an audible exhale. And then finally, another audible inhale. And an audible exhale. And now as you focus your thoughts to the greatness of God, just stay centered in that space, paying attention to your breathing as I read the scripture coming from Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. As we breathe in God, we breathe out discomfort. As we breathe in God, we breathe out anxiety. As we breathe in God, we breathe out confusion. As we breathe in God, we breathe out worldly noise. As we breathe in God, we breathe in the quietness that only the Lord can give us. As we breathe in God, we breathe in the love and the comfort that only God can give us. As we breathe in God, we breathe in peace, gentleness. Breathing in God, focusing on your breath. As I read back over Psalms 23, NIV version. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures. The Lord leads me beside quiet waters. The Lord refreshes my soul. The Lord guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for the Lord is with me. The Lord's rod and the Lord's staff, they comfort me. As we prepare to rejoin our morning worship service, we will move back into our three audible breaths with our first inhale, 
and that audible exhale, thanking the Lord for the Lord's comfort during our darkest times. Another audible inhale and an audible exhale, thanking the Lord for the peace during unrest. And our final audible inhale and our audible exhale. Thanking the Lord for being our shepherd and therefore we lack for nothing. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And certainly I was glad when they said unto me, that I couldn't go to the house of the Lord, but I certainly can gather in the house of the Lord and share with you a house of the Lord experience via the virtual um, platform. Good morning and God, good afternoon, whatever the time might be for you, Bethlehem, and certainly for those of you who are sharing with us in this virtual space, we welcome you to the Bethlehem Missionary Baptist Church, Church Through the Roof. And we welcome you on our graduates day. We give God praise and thanks for another Lord's Day. Thank you, Dr. Carol McKinley Alvarez for once again helping us to get centered and then certainly for our music ministry, we thank God for you providing for us our music for this day. Again, our gratitude um, is endless for the wonderful brothers who help us from the Praise Fellowship Bible Church uh, with our media support. God bless you and thank God for you. And certainly throughout this pandemic, these 15 <clears throat> plus months, uh, we have been uh, steered with such great support uh, coming to us through our administration, particularly the administrative assistant of Sister Lisa Johnson. We give God praise for you. Thank you, Ms. Camila, and certainly for my son-in-law, Cam, uh, for sharing with us uh, this morning with our Christian Empowerment Hour, helping us uh, to develop a language of love, a language for disciples of Jesus as we explore this incredible um, document uh, that talks about nonviolent communication. And certainly that is needed. And if we're going to be the light of the world and we're going to be the salt of the earth, we want it to show up in our communication with one another, but also as we communicate to the world so that we can help to move this world toward being the world that God wants it to be. Thank you also for those of you who continue to share in Tuesday talks and certainly for our amazing wow experience. We just give God praise for that. Again, today is Graduates Day and we're grateful to God for the amazing graduates of the Bethlehem Missionary Baptist Church. And you will be hearing from our graduates and you'll be hearing one who's graduating from high school and she's on her way to college, and we want you to be in prayer with her, and certainly Bethlehem, we want you to be in support of her, and that will be Miss Jasmine Farmer. And then our other graduate, uh, Miss Brianna Robinson, graduates from HBCU, Hampton University, one of our flagship universities uh, of the black community, and she will share with us um, the graduation speech. Uh, we're going to favor her on, and, and be blessed by her as she shares with us the graduation speech. And we're excited about her because she is on her way to law school, already been accepted into the Hastings Law School. And we're excited about that. And you will see her when she comes. She's going to have all types of little tassels and stuff from honor society, from honor society, uh, from science to tassels. Just an amazing young lady. Both of these young ladies, I am proud to say that they are part of my family. And I give God praise for both of them. And you will be hearing from them 
uh, following Worship music uh, from the choir. Because of who he is. Uh, we adore him in fresh and powerful ways. You might be like the little kids say, why should we adore the Lord? Well, we adore him because it sets the tone for our praying. Yes. We should, he should receive our heartfelt adoration. And then it builds our faith. It increases our intimacy with God. And it is our responsibility and privilege to adore the King of Kings. So my, no matter where you may be, I invite you to lift your hands and let's adore the Lord. Come let us adore. Hallelujah. Come ah, let us adore him. Ah, ah. Come come let us adore him because Jesus Christ yeah, is God. Sing it for me. Come, let us adore him. Come, let us adore
losses. My freshman year, I lost my Aunt Ina and my Grams. And as my senior year of college was beginning to wrap up, I lost my mom. All three of these women were pillars of strength within my life, and they were taken from me at a time I felt I needed them the most. But that just goes, but that just goes to show, we never know what we truly need, but God does. I use the losses and the fact that I have over 10 younger siblings looking up to me to motivate me to keep going. God, while in college, was sending me different obstacles that would help me to grow into a better student, woman, and leader. College challenged me in more ways than one. I was challenged academically, mentally, and spiritually. And for the first time, I no longer had my granny to guide me, and I was across the country in a new state and at a new school. I had to cultivate a new life for myself and imagine for myself what my present and future will look like. This was not an easy task for me, especially since I attended the illustrious Hampton University. Hampton was quite intimidating at first. Hampton is full of tradition, and there are kids who attend that parents and grandparents attended. There were students there that already had strong connections and ties to the school. And here I was, a first-generation student whose parents surely did not go to college. I had to navigate and figure out things a lot of the time on my own. And this fostered within me new insecurities I never knew I had before. I started to have these feelings of inadequacy. I went from being one of the only black people in my AP classes in high school, starting my own club for women on campus, and being on the debate team, to being just another intelligent black kid in a sea full of very intelligent and capable, and capable black kids. It was something I had never seen, let alone experienced. This made me doubt and question myself a lot. And college may bring feelings of inadequacy or other insecurities, whether you attend a PWI or an HBCU. But always remember that you are enough and that you worked hard to make it to this point in your life. All of the things that you have gone through prepares you for the journey that you will be beginning to embark on. And always remember to keep in mind that God will always be with you. Personally, college forced me to grow spiritually. For the first time in my life, I had to foster my own relationship with God that was not in relation to my grandmother or the church. I had to figure out what God truly meant to me and what my newfound relationship with, with him would look like. Bethlehem and my granny set an amazing foundation for me to build off of. And it's not until you're away from the things you're most familiar with that you understand how important a spiritual foundation is. College was also a time in which I was challenged academically and mentally. In college, the stakes feel higher when you or your family is paying for every class you take. Yeah. There comes pressure not to fail and to get the very best grades possible. And the reality is, getting an A plus in every class isn't always possible. Yeah. And that is okay. Sometimes you fall short or even fail. But never stop believing in yourself. While in college, I was, I was very hard on myself, and if you let me tell it, I was not that great of a writer. I spent most of my collegiate career doubting my capabilities. Don't be like me. Don't be afraid to be confident and to identify where your strong suits lie. Because they would take you a long way. And to be honest, I didn't start to believe I was a good writer until my legal writing teacher told me I was one of the best writers in this class. Writing was something I was uncertain about, and God led me to use the very thing I was uncertain about to push me forward. If it wasn't for my writing skills, I would not be going to the law school of my choice, and I would not be up here speaking to you all today. Not only did God help me to identify my strong suits, but he placed amazing people in my life. Some of these amazing people happened to be my professors. The professors in my life that I built a relationship with encouraged me, guided me, and even wrote recommendations for internships, and my law school applications. So please take the time to talk to your professors because you never know who or where your blessings may come from. Right, right. And if the next step for you is not college, always remember to build meaningful relationships with the adults around you. God has also placed amazing people within my life outside of school. 
God blessed me with an amazing pastor that never stops encouraging me and believing in me. He also blessed me with an amazing church family that has kept me in their prayers and shown me support in so many ways. Without all the amazing adults I have had around me, I don't know if I would have made it this far. So never be afraid to lean on the people you have around you because they will be there for you to hold you up when you feel weak. College was not just this time of existential crisis in my life. It was also a time in my life where I had so much fun and was able to be, to be selfish and do the things I truly wanted to do. In college, I made lifelong friends and bonds that I will have for the rest of my life. Yeah. Keep in mind, you will make lifelong friends, but you will also encounter people you are really close with one semester and grow apart from the next. Mm -hmm. And that's normal. Right. I created so many fun memories that I would think about for the rest of my life, from running across campus to making all time to class, okay. to figure out, figuring out how to stretch the little amount of money I had in my account, mm. to going to Virginia Beach for College Beach Weekend, oh, no. to racing home to study for finals week that started the next day. Yeah, yeah. College was full of amazing times. Make sure you always remember what you're truly there for, but don't be afraid to live a little. Yeah. Because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Before you know it, you'll be walking across the stage again. Also, keep in mind that not everyone that not everyone you meet will be raised like you, possess the same morals as you, and may even think completely different than you. And that's okay too. Mm -hmm. College in the world we live in can be very com competitive and cutthroat. Mm. Always try always try to rise to the occasion, but never let the environment that you are immersed in change you into someone you do not recognize. Wow. Always try to stay true to who you are and never feel afraid to create boundaries within school and with the people around you. And please don't fall victim to peer pressure. Hmm. Being successful in college is all about managing your time and being aware of who and how you spend your time. Yeah. There will be those people in your class that on social media always seem to be at kickback or having some fun and these same people will somehow still be excelling in class. It may make you question yourself, like why am I always studying and sacrificing and there are people who are always at social events doing better than me. I'm going to need you to toss thoughts like that out of your head. Social media is a bunch of smoke and mirrors. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. People tend to post the fun and exciting things. Mm -hmm. Your peers will be less likely to post the all-nighters they pull, studying, and the connections they make behind the scenes with your professors. So never ever compare yourself or try to be like anyone else. Jealousy and comparison is truly the thief of joy. Mm. Your journey will look different. Your, your journey will look different than your peers, and that is okay. Right, right. Remember to always stay true to yourself and your goals. From the outside looking in, what someone has achieved or has may always look better than what you have. But you never know what they endured or how hard they worked in order to get there. So remember to focus on your own journey and don't slow yourself down or stunt your growth by worrying about someone else. Right, right. Whether you decide to go to a four-year university, a junior college, take a gap year, or not go to college at all, it is your decision and there are so many different pathways to success. Right. Your parents' dreams for you are just that, their dreams. Make sure you are doing what makes you happy and what will help you reach your goals. Because at the end of the day, you are going to have to live with the decisions you make. Right, right. And if you still don't know what path you are meant to take, that is okay. You still have time. Make sure to have long conversations with yourself mm -hmm. about what you truly want because it is in those random moments when you're laying in bed thinking that things become more clear. Mm -hmm. a, lot of the, a lot of the things I'm saying may seem very cliche, but are true. Yeah. All the little things I was told all my life from family, teachers, and mentors were actually true, and the things I brushed off but ended up using while in college. In elementary school, you learn about the buddy system, right. and this teaches you not to go certain <clears throat> places alone. Mm -hmm. I used that same buddy system when I went to parties or when walking back from the cafe at night. Mm -hmm. In college, I remember to never put my cup down and to always leave with who I came with. These are some of the little cliche things I was told my whole life that kept me safe while at school. Your parents and the adults around you might seem a little annoying with the lectures and the advice, okay. 
But just know that all the little things they have instilled in you and told you will, will be very useful in your next chapter in life. Right. I say all this, not just the graduates of 2021, I'm saying all these things to encourage myself as well. Right. I, too, will be embarking on a new uncertain chapter in my life. Law school will be something I have never experienced before. Mm. And attending a university where only 3% of students look like me wow. will be something I have never experienced before. Mm. But I will not let uncertainty stop me, and neither will you. Mm. You will go on to do great things, and big, bigger than you've ever imagined, and so will the other graduates listening to me speak today. The class of 2021 persevered and did not let adversity stop them. And that is why this is only the beginning and greater things are in store. And with God, the support from your family, the encouragement and prayers from the members of Bethlehem, the check-ins from pastor, and the strength within you, your options are truly endless. Yeah. Yeah. If you take nothing else from this speech, always know that you are more than capable. Hmm. And you are ready for the journey ahead. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Jasmine Farmer. I graduated from St. Mary's College High School on June 5th, 2021. I graduated with high honors and I received the Athlete of the Year Award. I will be attending Laney College in the fall, majoring in business and accounting, while also playing basketball. I plan on transferring out to another university or possibly HBCU. Also, I'm currently studying to receive my real estate license so that I can be an agent within the real estate field. I would like to thank not only my family, but God as well and the church community for being here with me through this process. I'm on to bigger and better things, and I just want to thank you all. Thank you. God, we bless you and praise you for this day. This is the day of, of our gradu graduates, and we, God, we want to honor you for giving us as a people, young people who have aspirations to go beyond where they are. And God, we ask you to bless them and to keep them. But God, open us up, we pray, as, as we listen to your word, and we pray you bless your word, sanctify each ear as well as my mouth, and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, who is our strength and our redeemer, in your name we pray. Being that we've already had an amazing message, an amazing message, uh, I will not be before you too long, uh, but I do think it necessary and I do believe that, it's, that it could be helpful if you would get a pastoral word on this graduate's day. As you can see, I'm wearing my academic attire. I get a chance to wear it two or three times a year, and I'm always proud uh, to uh, say that I, too, um, am a college graduate, went to an HBCU, and also went to other leading colleges, and I'm grateful for the college experience. Uh, but I want to speak to you and I want to continue <clears throat> with the I am's, um, but I want to kind of hybrid it or rather accentuate education. I want to look, John, Nevin, those of you who shared with us uh, in our wow experience on Wednesday, you will be familiar with this text. John chapter 11, and I want to grab the 17th verse and read to the 27th. I'll be reading from the new uh, revised standard version. Again, I will just kind of be a little brief, kind of hit the high points of what I will certainly develop to be a full-scale message uh, that we can share with the world. But John says, in John 11, John 11, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. <clears throat> when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, 
if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. <clears throat> Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe you are the son of God, the one coming into the world. So on this graduate day, <clears throat> this day we celebrate uh, the marvelous young people, not just ours here at the Bethlehem Missionary Baptist Church, but for young people all around the country. In particular, I speak to those who, um, who pitch your tent in the black community. And I want to talk about <coughs> resurrection education, resurrection uh, education, resurrection education. It's important for us to understand that ever since our slave ancestors walked out of slavery, young blacks were encouraged to get an education. So you young people, you are not the first one to have been encouraged, but ever since our enslaved uh, ancestors walked out of slavery, uh, young blacks were encouraged to get an education. Education was deprived from, of, uh, from our slaved, enslaved ancestors, but it seemed to be that they understood something, that freedom and education go together. Freedom and education was like a hand and a glove, that they go together. Uh, and we didn't, we didn't have our own schools at the time, but we still were encouraged to get an education. No one had money to send us to college or to school at the time, uh, uh, but we still were told to get an education. Many of our parents and grandparents never went to school themselves, but they still encouraged young blacks, and they encouraged me, and they encouraged you to get an education. Interestingly, the jobs were were few because there were not many jobs open up to blacks, but we still were encouraged to get an education. We were encouraged of uh, those of us who showed promise to leave the farms or leave the white folks' plantations and go and get an education. That's what they was told us to do. Of interest was the fact that the education that we were encouraged to get was not specifically uh, an education designed um, to uh, empower black people. We were not told to get what I'm talking about today, a resurrection education. We were, in fact, indoctrinated uh, for those who went into a slave education. There was no campaign among white people to educate black people uh, to be free Although many white philanthropists and many white missionaries helped to establish black colleges, but their intention was not to necessarily for blacks to be free, independent, self-determined, and self-loving. A lot of times they helped us to, to, to establish schools and colleges like the one I attended, Bishop College, so that we would not be bothering them about getting into their colleges. We were taught. Basically, what the Brazilian psychologist Paul, uh, Paulo Freire described as the pedagogy of the oppressed. In other words, in the words of Carter G. Woodson, we were miseducated Negroes. We were miseducated into becoming what we had always been, which were slaves dependent upon the oppressive arrangements of the status quo. There was nothing that we were told about going to get an education that was going to make you love blackness. It was more about going to make you love America, the country of our oppression. But then the late Reverend Manuel Scott made an observation. He made, this, he made this observation that white people made a tactical error, said Dr. Scott. He said in the name 
of advancing a colonizing and oppressive religion they made a tactical error they introduced us to Jesus and when they introduced us to Jesus we identified with Jesus we identified with him because he was like so many of us poor he was marginalized he was invisibilized and you know the story he was he was eventually um, profiled and arrested and crucified but the Bible tells us that God raised him up and the resurrection became the vaccination to institutionalize oppression. I wish I could make it plain. And so here we are today across the centuries. We believe as did Paul that just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we too are raised from the dead. And if we are raised from the dead, our education needs to be raised from the dead. Now while our emancipated ancestors used the same building for the church that they used for the school, they did not ever, I don't believe, I see no record of it, where they intentionally integrated and developed a curriculum that addresses what I'm talking about today. They did not intentionally see that we can use the church house that we were using for the school house to develop a curriculum around resurrection education. And I believe that we are in this moment, as you've heard from our young sister, Miss Brianna Robinson, that we need to seize this moment to do what most needs to be done, and that's to develop and promote a resurrection education. Because we need some young people to integrate the death, the burial, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus into their academic pursuits. Their, their, their faith in God should not be separated from their faith in education. We need an educational approach that will empower our people to live beyond the graves of light, being black people in America. We need some graduates to commence from the education of our oppressors into the education of our liberation. We need resurrection education. And so the idea that's going to drive this little short talk that I'll have with you all this morning is that resurrection education, it empowers oppressed people to use the learning experiences of life and even of the academy to bring new life into context defined by death. What we didn't get at the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, and then for those who didn't get the word until 1865, the Juneteenth, we can do it in 2021. We can leave this context of death, and we can set in motion an educational trajectory for new life possibilities. We don't have to stay in these graveyards of death that have been assigned to black life in America. We can use what God has given us, both church and the academy, to shape resurrection uh, res uh, education. I believe we can find some help within the text that I've, we've selected. It's important to notice that in this text, there was a family composed of the same people of Jesus, poor, marginalized, poor, invisibilized, poor, stigmatized, and death came into their situation. And this is important for us to understand because just as they were marginalized, and invisibilized, and they too were stigmatized, there, there was nothing in the Roman educational school system that had anything to do with liberating Jews. I come to tell you that an education without a resurrection foundation, all it's gonna do is perpetuate the systemic beliefs and practices of a world defined by death. We will basically keep doing what we've always been doing and insanely believe that we're gonna get some different results. A recent study came out not too long ago. In fact, this past week in the New York Times, it hit also the CNN news, for those of you who look at the news, but it said that America is more segregated now than it was prior to the Civil Rights Movement. Some of us right here 
in the Bay Area, Marin County, just this week, symbolically integrated the poorly equipped school for black people in Marin City with the academically enriched academy in Sausalito. And mind you, they didn't do it because they wanted to do it. They did it because they were pressured to do it. And so the relevant question comes to us as we, as we explore this text. What does it mean to have a resurrection education? It appears to me when I look at the text that a resurrection education, it approaches life with the hopeful belief that first and foremost, our sicknesses, sicknesses don't have to kill us. Lazarus got sick. Jesus heard he got sick. His disciples heard he got sick. And then they heard that the sickness, Jesus said, it was not unto death, but he did die. But the point I want to make is our sicknesses, those ill and, and adverse realities that we live with, they don't have to kill us. Are y'all with me? See, when, uh, it's helpful to know that most deaths are preceded by sickness. In other words, we get signs that something is wrong. Now, I raise that up because we have a sickness in the black community, and that's a sickness that we have perpetuated uh, through from slavery onward, and that's the sickness of black self-hatred. Our sickness, y'all, doesn't have to kill us. We can do like these amazing young women. We can start loving ourselves, loving ourselves out of our sicknesses of hating one another and shooting one another and killing one another and, and exposing one another to abuses and violence. Our sicknesses don't have to kill us. That's the first thing a resurrection education ought to help us with is that our sicknesses don't have to kill us. The other thing I saw in the text I found quite interesting and that is the text just made us an interesting turn. It made a turn that it talks about Jesus had arrived into the city and he went to the tomb. Uh, and Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. But the text says that some people all the way from Jerusalem, and you know they had to walk, most of them walk, they walk uh, down to Mary and Martha's house to console them about their brother. What you getting at? What you see in the text is they had some long standing traditions that they would help uh, uh, the mourners to process death. They had a long standing tradition and cultural practices uh, that helped people to get through their losses, to get through death. They had uh, trained weepers and mourners who would show up. And if you were internalizing your pain, they would help you to cry. Well, I want to say something about all of that because we too have some long-standing traditions and cultures. And our long-standing traditions and culture around death is most, uh, most time is helping us uh, to live with death, uh, to help us to get past death. But if we're going to have a resurrection education, our long-standing traditions and cultural practices should not always define us. We ought to be thinking about how do we get beyond these death-dealing practices? How do we get beyond these death-dealing realities in the black community? Not just give traditional and cultural responses to them. Don't allow those to define us, but a resurrection education will have us doing something different and it will have us how moving toward finding ways to bring new life into these contexts of death. I'm reading a marvelous book. I encourage you, those of you who read, get it if you want. It's entitled Think Again, brilliant one white scholar, psychologist, organizational psychologist, Adam Grant. Talk about Think Again. And he talks about 
education or learning. And he said that the purpose of learning isn't to affirm our beliefs, it's to evolve our beliefs. That's what a resurrection education, it ought to evolve our beliefs and make our beliefs uh, more meaningful and relevant to the world in which we live, not just affirming what we think we already know, but move us beyond some of this stuff so that we don't become defined and confined to just our long-standing cultures and tradition. I'm finished now, but I do need to say something because what, Mar what the Mary does or Martha does helps us because Mary stayed home. I did tell y'all that, didn't I? Mary stayed home, but Martha went out to meet Jesus. Now, some of y'all graduates, y'all gonna just leave and stay home. But there gonna be some of us who gonna go out into the world and who gonna go places like young Brianna, go all the way to the other side of the country, leave her people, leave familiar surroundings and go and find herself in a context where not only is just overwhelmingly uh, black, but it's blacks who've been there through generations. I wish I could make it plain. And what, so, but she left, and if you listen to her very, very carefully, she said something that'll help you to leave home. Mary stayed home. Martha went to see Jesus. Mary stayed home. Martha went to see Jesus. And what I'm trying to get at is that when you go uh, see the Lord, the Lord can birth some new life possibilities. I know Martha probably went home and told Mary about the resurrection. But what if she'd have just been there to hear it for herself? Our relationship with God, our relationship with the Lord Jesus can birth some new life possibilities. All of us need to hear, as young Brianna heard all the way in Hampton University, as little Miss Jasmine Farmer will hear even as she goes into college and plays in the sport, she will hear and they will have to hear these words from the Lord. And when it catches them in a place where hopes die, and aspirations uh, uh, seem faint, you'll need to hear the word of the Lord. I am the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in me, even though they will die or be in these death-like contexts, they will live and everyone who lives and believes in the Lord will never die. I want to encourage us to consider uh, during this season that we're walking out of this space of death that we will see education in a new light that we will see education as an opportunity to propagate and, and perpetrate and, and promulgate uh, the resurrection possibilities. God bless you and may the Lord keep you. Perhaps there's someone in this virtual space and you've been in here this space with us for over 15 months. I want to appeal to you. Uh, if you're some young person, I want to appeal to you. Don't just go to school and get an A education. Get a resurrection education. Get an education that's going to bring some new life possibilities in these contexts that so much shape the black community. That you can bring new life, new possibilities, new hope, and new dreams. I encourage you, my young people. I encourage those of us who are the caretakers of young people. Don't just tell them to get an education. Tell them to get a resurrection education. One that will help them know that our sicknesses don't have to kill us. All this stuff going on in our community, it doesn't have to kill us. Our long-standing traditions and cultural practices, they don't have to eternally define us. But praise be to God, we can go to the Lord who will help us find new life possibilities. Give your life to the Lord. Uh, and if you are near a community of people, uh, uh, I encourage you to join them. You certainly can come and go with us at the Bethlehem Missionary Baptist Church as we aspire uh, to propagate and certainly 
to communicate the need for resurrection education. God, we bless you and praise you for the day. We're thankful for our amazing graduates, young ladies, amazing, beautiful, black, and brainy, and skilled, and gifted young black women. I pray, God, that they can continue to navigate all of these death defined, these death dealing realities of the black community. That they can experience new life possibilities in their educational pursuits, but also in their life. We lift them up, Miss Brianna Robinson. God, you go with her as she goes to law school. Go with little Miss Jasmine as she goes to junior college and makes her way uh, to a four year university. Go with them. Help them uh, to navigate uh, these death-dealing realities. And God, may they go forth with a resurrection education. And now unto him who's able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding great joy. The all-wise God, our Heavenly Father, be both power and dominion now and forever. And the people of God said, Amen and amen.